Okay, it's going to be a review of King of the Ring 2001. So we're going all the way back to June 24th, 2001. I remember the same week school ended uh, from East Rutherford, New Jersey, the Continental Airlines Arena, you know, the Meadowlands in, uh, in New Jersey, which is funny because when, when I think back to this uh, week, I remember this is the same week that the Nets traded Stephon Marbury to Phoenix for Jason Kidd. So the Nets go from not even making the playoffs to getting all the way to the NBA Finals that year. So that's one of the best trades in NBA history, without a doubt, like Kurt Angle would say. So 17,000 in attendance, pay-per-view buy rate of 445,000 pay-per-view buys, which it, th that's an interesting number because it's a lot higher than Judgment Day, 25,000 higher than the Judgment Day number. So you could say, oh, you put Benoit and Jericho in the main event. You know, that's that that's a great jump. But, you know, this is King of the Ring. It is a big five. So you would expect a jump. But it's a little bit lower than King of the Ring 2000. So you're not having Austin in 2000, but you still had The Rock in 2000. That got 30,000 more. And you don't even have WCW as competition. So I think you can argue that the buy rate is, is a little disappointing. But uh, but yeah, man, you know, I, I, I love this pay-per-view. I, I, I really do. I have a lot of uh, personal connection to it. It's the first pay-per-view me and my brother ordered, I, I, I want to say since uh, King, uh, Survivor Series 1996. So Survivor Series 96 when Sean lost the belt to Sid. That was probably the last time we ordered a pay-per-view um, until King of the Ring 2001. So... My brother got really back into it when Austin came back. I, I think he talked about this in the WrestleMania 17 video. And, uh, you know, he was having these pay-per-view parties down the street. And I think eventually he just got tired of going there or whatever. I remember he was really into the Benoit Jericho push. So, um, you know, I remember that was the same week as uh, graduation. I think he graduated eighth grade uh, that week. So I, I do remember me and my dad went for a workout at the the high school track we were just we would do, we would do this this workout that we call early birds just running push-ups sit-ups leg lifts and then when we got back that night I, I remember i joined my brother in progress like during the edge and rhino match and i was just like i was shocked at what i saw i was like especially that kurt angle shane mcmahon match i just i was hooked you know i watched raw the, the next night and just got really into the invasion so this was like the start of you know, my new love for pro wrestling. You know, I was really, I was always into it, like in the early 90s when, you know, Hogan and Warrior were there. That was when I was like a really little kid, like first grade, second grade, whatever. But, you know, this was kind of like my renewed love for pro wrestling, you know, this whole time going into the invasion. So I just wanted to make that point. So the, the pay-per-view does have a lot of sentimental value for me. So, uh, so let's get right down to it. Uh, first, the first thing I want to talk about on this show, just to kind of get it out of the way, is this uh, Undertaker uh, Diamond Dallas Page uh, uh, storyline? So, uh, so after Judgment Day, these uh, segments started appearing on Raw where someone was actually videotaping the Undertaker's wife Sarah uh, stalking her. So there was this whole storyline about you know who's who's stalking the Undertaker's wife, and uh, probably when I when I went back to watch some of these Raws uh, uh, a couple years ago, I, I remember. You know, probably the highlight of this whole thing, probably the only good thing that came from this was there was an Undertaker and Kurt Angle promo. And, and Taker goes up to Angle. He's like, there's rumors of you stalking my wife. I want to know what the hell's going on. I want some answers. And then Angle's like, I, I met your wife before. I didn't even think she was that attractive. Then Undertaker's like, you son of a bitch. And gives him the last ride. So I thought that was funny as hell. Because, I, you know, I, I kind of agree, like, with Angle. I never really found Sarah to be that attractive. I mean, I can see why the Undertaker likes her. You know, she, she her body and her look is very reminiscent of, uh, you know, Michelle, Michelle McCool. But, uh, yeah, so Diamond Dallas Page kind of starts off this pay-per-view saying, take her. I'm daring you to make me famous. And then y y you see on the Titan Tron all these videos appearing of someone stalking DDP as he's coming into the arena. So it's actually Sarah just like videotaping DDP behind his back just to get like revenge. It was kind of whack. It was kind of weak. I mean, th this might have been the worst storyline of 2001 it's one of the reasons why i think people say the invasion sucked is i think a lot of it just has to do with this storyline and then you know there's all these uh there was all these reports on the dirt sheets that 
you know, say that, you know, why would DDP stalk the Undertaker's wife? He has he has the hot wife of his own. I think her name was Kimberly, like one of the best looking women in their history of pro wrestling. I don't I'm not that familiar with Kimberly, but yeah, you know, the, the the bottom line is I, I thought this, this this was just a bad feud. You know, I, I you could tell DDP's heart really wasn't in it. I don't think anyone wants to be labeled as a stalker. Um, you know, it's it's just it's just not a pleasant thing to to be attached to. So uh, you know, DDP even admitted that he he really wanted to get away from the stalker thing and became the positively page uh, character over the years. But you know, I, I got to blame Undertaker too. Like Undertaker's just been involved. You know, when you look back at his career, there's just been a lot of angles, a lot of storylines that that just didn't work. So I'm not going to blame it all on the writers. I'm not going to blame it all on DDP. You know, eventually, I, I think DDP and Taker should have had a match. This was just more of a confrontation of, you know, Undertaker just beating the crap out of DDP. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was just kind of a forgettable thing. And, you know, ultimately, the, the funny thing is what, what people forget about is right before Invasion, DDP like kidnapped Debra and uh you know the, the Austin actually you know saw it on the Titan Tron and then went backstage so it definitely looked like they were building towards an Austin DDP thing if, if they kept Austin face but they decided to have Austin you know turn on Kurt Angle and uh ultimately uh join the alliance so that didn't last very long at all but yeah that's just the whole Undertaker uh DDP thing I'm, I'm not a big fan of it. it was definitely the weakest weakest thing on this show and and uh, I would actually say probably the the worst the worst storyline of 2001 without a doubt. Okay, so let's just get right down to the King of the Ring tournament right here. All right, before I get into the tournament, Kurt Angle actually defeats Hardcore Holly and Jeff Hardy to get to the pay-per-view. Edge actually defeats Test. 10 minutes. That match actually did get a lot of time. Edge versus Test. They actually have strong matches. So uh, I, I definitely like to go back and, and, and check that out down the road. Uh, Edge actually defeats Perry Saturn as well. To get to the pay-per-view, Rhino defeats Taz and Tajiri, and then Christian actually defeats Kane, and the Big Show, believe it or not, I wonder what the hell happened there, two minutes and 19 seconds. <laughs> okay, so let's get let's just get down to the uh, the pay-per-view matches, the semifinal matches, so Kurt Angle actually takes on Christian, you know, the, you had the whole storyline with Angle trying to get his gold medals back, and Edge actually got sick of Angle bitching about the gold medals. So there was definitely some dissension between Team ECK, Edge, Christian, and Kurt. You know, they, they, this was pretty much a stable for, you know, well over a year at this point. Uh, even Rhino was 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 actually part of their, uh, you know, traveling uh, team. Um, so, so yeah, Kurt Angle and Christian, I, I thought this was a good way to open up the show. I, I think Angle and Christian have great chemistry. Eventually in TNA, they would go on to have some really strong matches. The, the, the first two matches that they had in, uh, uh, 2008 at final resolution and against all odds, just really good stuff between those two. But here, you know, you really didn't get to see Kurt and, and Christian wrestle a lot at this time. You know, they were always both heels. Uh, but yeah, definitely good stuff here. I, I thought this was a strong opener. The fans were definitely in the angle. Uh, like I, like I was saying in 2000, I, I felt like the fans were really starting to embrace angle in 2000. So this is a whole year later. So if they weren't ready for the baby face turn, then they were definitely ready for it. Now a angle just got a lot of respect and, uh, you know, Christian was kind of more of a tweener here. They were really kind of transitioning edge and Christian into baby faces for the invasion. So, uh, but fans were definitely more so behind Angle. You know, they, they couldn't trust Christian. It kind of had that demeanor towards uh, uh, the match. A Angle did some beautiful belly to bellies here. Uh, just thought he looked sharp. You know, it, uh, Angle actually did suffer a concussion. I believe it was from a spinning heel kick from Christian. But I'll tell you what though, like it didn't, it didn't really seem like it threw Angle off that much. I I, I really thought this was good stuff. Uh, Shane McMahon actually came out to interfere. And I love this story, you know, because Shane and Angle are feuding. And, you know, Shane wanted Angle to, you know, wrestle the extra match just to make him tired. So I thought that was just a really good story right there. And, yeah, I, I mean, just beautiful stuff between uh, Angle and Christian. I mean, I'll tell you, they had great chemistry. That the a Angle actually goes for the ankle lock. Christian counters it into uh, an on prettier. Angle tries to hit him with the angle slam. Christian actually counters it into the on prettier to get the near fall. And then Shane McMahon actually uh, throws Christian off of the pin. And then, and then Christian's looking back at Shane like, what the hell are you doing? 
So Angle actually Angle slams Shane while he's, you know, over the top rope and brings him back into the ring to get the pinfall. Yeah, so good stuff. Just just, just sharp transitions to the to the unprettier into the angle slam. Uh, you know, considering that Kirk got a concussion in this match, I thought he was pretty good, you know, the rest of this night. Like it didn't seem like it affected him that much. It didn't really hurt him with promos either. So Angle talks about the concussion like he really had to fight off, you know, bad memory loss. But when I watched this back, it it, it was barely noticeable. And then next up, we have Edge taking on Rhino, uh, King of the Ring semifinal match. Uh, good match right here. I, I think the problem with this, though, was the crowd. The crowd really kind of hurt this match. I mean, they really weren't into either guy. Um, more so Edge than Rhino. Uh, you know, Rhino did get some ECW chance. But for the most part, I would say this crowd was just very, you know, I, I would say New Jersey just has a reputation of having very spoiled fans, very bloodthirsty fans. And, uh, yeah, I just thought they were kind of average for this. You know, Heyman was really getting behind Rhino on commentary. Um, you know, the, the, there, was, there was a pretty nasty spot, though, where Edge and Rhino tried to do the spear and the gore at the same time it just looked really dangerous like they both collided with each other it it definitely looked like it could have caused a concussion could have caused a disaster but I, I think they were okay uh there was an exposed turnbuckle here to to get to end with the finish where rhino actually missed the gore went head first and then edge hits him with the education which is a which JR called the Impaler DDT. I wasn't a big fan of that finish for Edge. I, I mean, I, I know he beat Eddie Guerrero off the ladder with it, and he would use it from time to time. But to me, Edge just, you know, his better finisher was definitely the the spear, the the uh, the execution and the Edge Omatic, which is like an inverted DDT. I never really thought they caught on as as well as Edge would have liked to. But yeah, Edge goes over Rhino. A solid match right there with it with a pretty piss poor crowd. And we move on to the next match. Next up, you had the Dudley Boys, Bubba Ray and Devon, tag team champions. So they actually beat Benoit and Jericho on SmackDown, where Austin actually cost them the titles uh, to take on Spike Dudley and surprise partner ended up being Kane. Uh, I, I got to give Kane credit, man. You know, I, I think any other main event, it would be like, well, why can't you use me better on the pay-per-view than this? But I, I give Kane a lot of credit. You know, I I think most main eventers would bitch about being just kind of thrown into a spot like this. But Kane seemed to embrace it and got a pretty good reaction when he came out there. But, you know, Spike Dudley was feuding with the Dudleys. You know, the Dudleys were really on Spike about him paying too much attention to his girlfriend, Molly. And then this is definitely the best month of Spike Dudley's life. You know, he ended up be, he ended up ripping apart uh, Stone Cold's peti petition to get out of the triple threat match. And. You know, he really kind of went to bat for his girlfriend. And, you know, so Spike Dudley just had a great month. You know, they pushed him. He was in, you know, main event uh, segments with, with Austin. You know, you can't get much higher than that. And uh, ultimately, he loses to the Dudleys here. They actually, you know, they actually countered the, the, um, the, Doug, the Dudley dog into the 3D to get the victory there. But, yeah, there is really some miscommunication between Devon and Kane. And the crowd started booing at that point. But... Yeah, I mean, this is something that could have been on SmackDown. You know, if it was on SmackDown, it would be, like, acceptable. But for a pay-per-view match, it just felt like filler. All right, so next up, we have the King of the Ring finals. we got Edge uh, taking on Kurt Angle. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Angle comes out and cuts a promo on Edge. It basically says, realistically, Edge, there, there's no way you're beating me here tonight. So it's only right that you, as my friend, uh, you know, forfeit this match and let me win the King of the Ring. He's like, I think I know you, Edge. So you could spare the embarrassment of me handing your handing your your butt to you tonight. Like that that, that promo just sound sounded confusing. But considering Angle had a concussion, I thought he pulled it off pretty nicely. And uh, you know, it was funny. Edge kind of looked a little insecure at the time. Like he looked like he was a little bit intimidated. You know, being in this spot with Angle. Like it wasn't like the Edge that's full of rage and emotion that we just saw coming back on SmackDown last night against Roman Reigns. Um, so, yeah, you know, Ed, Ed, Edge definitely grew up a lot since then. I, I think this whole King of the Ring uh, definitely did a lot for him. But ultimately, Edge declines and starts punching Kurt Angle. And uh, Edge and Angle have a good match right here. I thought it was good. I thought this was good stuff. Obviously, it's overshadowed by the 2002 stuff where it really went into near fall overkill mode. But Angle did some nasty belly-to-bellies where he actually tosses Edge over the ring and... 
Yeah, I mean, I just thought this th this was definitely good stuff here. You know, you you, you saw, um, you know, Edge actually counter the German into an, a really nice uh, uh, small package. And, uh, you know, they, they definitely did some good stuff here. It wasn't, I don't know, I feel like this match gets really, really underrated. And then you had Christian coming out trying to help Edge win the match. Or you know, actually trying to screw Edge. But when Edge was looking at him, he was acting like he was trying to help him. But he really wasn't. He was really trying to screw Edge, which we'll find out down the road. You know, Christian was starting to get more and more jealous of Edge uh, uh, at, at this time. And then Shane McMahon comes out of nowhere, the spear Kurt Angle. Edge hits Angle with the Impaler DDT, the execution, uh, to win the King of the Ring. And it was cool, man. I, I thought I thought Edge really needed to win uh, King of the Ring. It was it was really a chance to uh, uh, push a new star. Uh, they were in the midst of turning Edge babyface. And uh, he cut a great promo. The next night on Raw with William Regal during the King of the Ring coronation, I, I thought that came off great. Where uh, Billy Gunn came out and Edge, Edge told Billy Gunn, uh, you know, I won't Billy Gunn this King of the Ring because I plan on being entertaining. And I think he had that line where you, you sound like a, I don't know, he didn't, he didn't use the Wayne's World line there. But yeah, I won't Billy Gunn this King of the Ring. That's a pretty bad put down, you know, because <laughs> Edge said, you know, if two years from now, my job is to go to WWF New York and eat a meatball sandwich, well, just shoot me in the friggin' head. And that's what Billy Gunn did, that King of the Ring. He was just, uh, he was at WWF New York and didn't even enter into the, uh, the, the, the tournament there. So, yeah, but, you know, <laughs> this was funny because after the match was over, Angle starts crying to the security guards. He's like, real smart, Shane, real smart, Shane. Now it makes sense. He wanted me to have the extra match. Well, if any WCW wrestler interferes in this match, their families will starve to death. They will go on welfare. I have influence with Mr. McMahon. This is not fair. I should be the two-time King of the Ring champion. And it's funny because Angle's looking at the security guards like they give a shit, and they really don't. And just the, it, it just came off great. You know, only Kurt Angle you know could pull off a promo like that. So I, I thought that was cool. And uh, Austin's actually doing these whole these other segments where he's looking for Vince because Vince isn't showing up. And, you know, he, you know, William Regal's trying to call Vince and then he's talking to the security in, in the parking lot saying, well, how far is uh, Stanford, Connecticut from here? He's like, when Vince shows up, you know, tell him to come to the ring. Just tell him to come to the ring. <laughs> and he's like, oh, all right, sure, Mr. Austin, I'll do that. Just the way Austin is looking at the security guards, it was just, I don't know, just, you know, there's just things about this pay-per-view that I probably find funny that most people don't, but... <laughs> Uh, but yeah, Edge is the new king of the ring. Uh, he had this catchphrase where he said, that reeks of awesomeness or reeks of royalty. So it was good. Edge kind of used the king of the ring to, to, to develop new, new catchphrases. And I, I think that's what you want. So next up, for the light heavyweight championship, we got Jeff Hardy taking on X-Pac. And, uh, yeah, you know, kind of underwhelming match right here. They actually put this on the King of the Best of the King of the Ring compilation. I have no idea why they did that. Uh, that kind of stuck out like a sore thumb. Uh, you know, I, I, I could see it, though. Like, I could see the appeal to the matchup. You know, Jeff Hardy and X-Pac, you know, uh, two light heavyweight guys, two high flyers. You know, the match was a lot of fun. It was fast-paced. Uh, X-Pac pulled out some suicidal offense. Uh, X-Pac actually hits the X-Factor. Jeff Hardy gets a foot on the rope. X-Pac basically dominates the match, but ultimately Jeff Hardy hits the Swanton Bomb uh, to get the victory. You know, Paul Heyman kind of mocked Jeff Hardy where he was he was kind of mocking the girls in the audience. It was like, oh, all the girlies, you know, chanting for Jeff Hardy as he does his, as he takes his shirt off. So you had that going on right there. But yeah, I just feel like the, you know, the light heavyweight championship it just didn't mean a lot. You know, The gym, when Jerry Lynn won the belt, it didn't even get on pay-per-view here. I just felt like the match was extremely rushed and, uh, you know, just could have been a lot better. Uh, you know, Heyman was really supportive of X-Pac here, saying that X-Pac or Sean Waltman, 123 Kid, brought a lot of prestige uh, to the light heavyweight division in America, which is something, you know, which you give them a lot of credit for because the light heavyweights weren't getting the respect that they got in Japan that they got in the United States. So, yeah, really insightful commentary from Heyman. Uh, but ultimately, I just feel like X-Pac had a really uh, disappointing invasion. He was really the one WWF superstar that remained a heel uh, during the invasion, even though he didn't uh, cross over the WCW. So I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, just kind of a generic victory for Jeff Hardy. And to be honest, I was never really that big of a Jeff Hardy 
fan is a singles guy. Um, but, you know, the next month, you know, he, he probably had some of the best singles matches of his career when, you know, Rob Van Dam uh, came into the fold. But, yeah, just the uh, the whole light heavyweight championship, it really kind of became an afterthought, even even when they merged with WCW. I, and I can't remember who merged the two belts. For some reason, it's just not coming to me. I know eventually Billy Kidman won the belt and everything, but I think they eventually kept it as the Cruiserweight Championship from WCW instead of just calling it the Light Heavyweight Championship. The belt just really never got off the ground for whatever the reason. All right, and then the, the next match, we got Kurt Angle uh, taking on Shane McMahon in a street fight. All right, so the, all right, there's a lot to say about this match. And I know I've talked about the match in pay-per-view rewinds and, the, and other compilations and DVDs before, but... You know, the the one thing I wanted to follow up on is the whole, you know, Shane McMahon promo. All right, so Angle wins the medals back after Judgment Day, and he's having his own uh, ceremony on the podium with you know, this confetti falling out of the sky. So Shane comes out and says the WCW is starting soon, and Angle's like, nobody cares. What people care about is my award ceremony, so do you mind? And Shane's like, well, Kurt, before I was so really interrupted, I just wanted to tell you what WCW stands for. You know, w could stand for wrestling, which you are very good at. C could actually stand for championship, which you don't possess any at the moment. And C could also stand for crayon or coyote, which is good enough for me. So <laughs> I can see why people were kind of mocking the promo. But uh, the whole point was so Shane could say W stands for wussy because he said Kurt Angle was a wussy when he was crying at the Olympics. So when Kate, when Shane gets onto the podium, he says, you know, W could stand for wussy. And then Angle actually jumps onto the podium and does a running Angle slam to him, which came off great. You know, it really kind of started the whole feud. And then Shane and Angle are just kind of going at it the whole month and trying to screw each other. And, uh, yeah, the whole story with, with Shane making Angle – wrestled the extra match just to tire him out and then ultimately screwing out of the king of the ring i thought that was a good storyline i thought it was good stuff uh so from a behind the scenes standpoint you know they've been very candid about how you know they rehearsed the match in the training facility in stanford connecticut i think it was called tracks where they where they filmed tough enough um so yeah so the the match was really well rehearsed uh you know they knew all the spots so a angle was saying that if you know, if they didn't rehearse, he would have blown this whole thing because the the concussion was uh, making him forget a lot of stuff. But, you know, Shane was able actually to, to help him through the match and everything. But but yeah, man, you know, I, I, I thought this was awesome. You know, to me, this is this is arguably the best match in King of the Ring history, the, the pay-per-view history. I, I also think it's, you know, without a doubt, the best Shane McMahon match I've ever seen. I just feel like this match has just a little bit of everything. Just... You know, it, it, it's got good brawling. It's just, it's got good mat wrestling. You know, it's, it's, it's just, it's just got high spots. It's got, you know, it's got violent spots. It's, it's got blood. It's just, it's just got, it, it has that feeling of just a severe gut check. And, uh, I mean, it's just, there's just a lot of great things to say about the match. But one thing I did notice though, you know, watching this thing back is how, uh, you know, angry angle was, uh, in the beginning here. It, it, it definitely looked like Shane was a little bit too stiff. I guess they call it potato. Like, like Shane really kind of connected on some of the, the, uh, the punches, the forearms and, uh, you know, Kurt, Kurt actually starts yelling at him. He's like, there's no way you're in my league, McMahon. No way. And then angle angle actually starts. You know, actually let Shane, you know, try to take him down in like a pro, like an amateur wrestling stance. And uh, and then Angle just starts like forearming him. So I I, I really love the mat work that they did here. E even that's that that segment where Angle starts bridging out of the pins and then Sh Shane just drops an elbow just to put an end to it. I thought that was good stuff. Uh, you know, Shane trying to kind of bait Angle in, uh, you know, with the it starts using the, the Singapore cane. I thought that was great stuff. Uh, Shane actually takes out a garbage, garbage can. Ultimately, does the shooting star press and misses on the garbage can. I thought that was a great high spot. I just, I just thought you had just some, uh, you know, even before they get to the glass, you just had some, some great catch me if you can type of street fight stuff. So, yeah, just really engaging stuff. And then, uh, you know, the whole King of the Ring set design. Um, apparently they, they had to switch the glass because they said the pyro would have exploded the sugar glass. So when, uh, th this King of the Ring set design is just really, it, it, there's like six pieces of glass 
And it's all, it was all ended up being plexiglass, which is just really tough to break. But the King of the Ring set looked really cool. Um, it just, it looked really, 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 uh, in, just, you know, state of the art, you know, pay-per-view set design material. It just, it just really, and it really looked, uh, awesome when, when Benoit came out, when, when, when Benoit came out, you could, they, they shot it. So you could see the broken glass as he was coming to the ring. It just looked really cool. But, um, but bottom line was, oh, as they were trying to get to the glass, like Angle actually breaks his tailbone. So Shane actually gives him a suplex uh, in the middle of the ring aisle. And, uh, you know, when, when Kurt took that bump, he he landed tailbone first. And, you know, he was talking about how, you know, over the years you learned that to break that fall, you actually kind of, you know, land on your foot first, you know, to kind of break it. But, you know, I, I would say that, you know, that's kind of dangerous, too, because, you know, you would think you would sprain an ankle by doing that. But I remember, like, watching Austin take that bump. He would actually, you know, uh, you know roll out his foot to kind of break the fall. So I guess that's that's more of the safe way to land. Uh, so Angle ended up breaking his tailbone, suffering a concussion. I mean, he was just a mess here. So, you know, you give Angle a lot of credit uh, for just getting through this match. Um, and then ultimately, you know, Kurt gives uh, Shane the belly to belly through the glass. The glass doesn't break at first. And then Shane's head just kind of lands on the uh, concrete and, uh, you know, thank God it didn't look that bad. It wasn't like his, he went head first to the concrete. Like Shane kind of, you know, twisted his head at the last second. I mean, that could have been a, a disaster right there. And then the second belly to belly angle put a little bit more oomph behind it. And then it breaks. And it was, and then that, that glass was so thick. It just, it was just like spl it was splitting them. You could just see like dark red blood just coming from everywhere. Angle even like said, you know, the, the glass started rubbing against his arm and sp split it open. And, uh, you know, it's funny, you know, why didn't you just put Shane through all six? There was actually six pieces of glass. Um, it's, it's surprising that Shane didn't go through all of them, but he went through two of them here. So for, so for the second one, you get you, when they're inside the actual king of the ring, you know, behind the glass, you know, you could definitely see they're trying to communicate with each other. Like Angle's trying to talk him out of doing the spot. Then Shane's like, yeah, just put me through, put me through. And then the referee... Thank God he blocks the camera to, to, so, so, you know, the camera doesn't pick up all the communicating. And then, and then Jim Ross. So Jim Ross and Paul Heyman start fighting about the glass where, where uh, you know, Paul Heyman is trying to make a point. Oh, this is really thick glass. Like, this is big time set design. And then, and then you know, did you know how much budget, you know, they, they, they had to pay for, like, the, you know, this kind of glass? And then Jim Ross is like, well, I'm not worried about the money or the budget. I'm worried about the, I'm worried about the human beings. And then, and then Paul Heyman's like, well, I'm not, I'm not talking about the money and the budget. I'm, I'm talking about the thickness of the glass this is big time set design and then all of a sudden finally you know angle just throws shane mcmahon head first it just came off great i mean they actually used that as the uh you know the uh for the video package for smackdown it just it was the visual was just something you've never seen before you know human being going through that type of glass it's uh it, it was crazy and then, and then Heyman says you know, angle uses his fourth eye you know he had the three eyes inten intensity integrity intelligence and the fourth eye is actually ingenious as he puts Shane McMahon on this rolling suitcase back to the ring yeah when they got back to the ring it was just just great stuff of uh, <laughs> eventually uh you know Shane kicks out and then he, st he starts uh hitting angle with the uh the trash can lid then hits him with the angle slam ultimately angle slingshots shane onto the top turnbuckle uses this big ass wood the thick wooden board i i can't even remember how they how they took it out but th that wooden board it was so it looked really strong it looked really thick so it was able to support angle doing the angle slam as shane is uh lying up on the top turnbuckle so so angle angle slams shane off the top rope as he's on the wooden board it came off great it just came off like shane was up there like it looked so high like that ride down just looked amazing and then it gets a huge holy shit chant and then uh you know angle finally puts him away i think the match is just it, it's incredible i mean this had everything high spots you know great brawling great you know just great everything i mean it's just so much replay value here and uh yeah it's it it's amazing that that one of angle's best matches actually comes from facing a non wrestler and uh without a doubt I, I would definitely say this is angle's you know his you know probably the best king of the ring performance anyone had i think you know Br brett brett's matches came within the tournament 
but I feel like the the overall performance from Angle was actually better on this show. Look, Angle was in the ring for what? Eight minutes here against Edge. It was 10 minutes. So 18 minutes plus 26. So 26 plus 18. All right. So about 45 minutes. You know, Brett might have been in the ring even longer that night. But I would definitely say this this performance from Angle, uh, fighting off the concussion, fighting off the broken tailbone, it's, it's probably even more of an impressive of a performance. You know, three matches on one show. And I agree. Uh, I was reading the comment section of the uh, of Angle's podcast where he, he, he went back with Conrad and, and watched this thing. And someone said in the comment section, whatever they paid Angle for this event, it, it wasn't enough. I, I hope he made more than Austin, but I doubt it. But uh, but yeah, uh, Ang Angle, uh, you know, no matter what, you know, the, you can always look back to this night and say, I don't I don't think anyone had to work harder or dig down deeper to get through this night than, than Kurt Angle did. And give Shane McMahon credit as well. I, I, so I would definitely say this about Shane McMahon, though. So obviously Angle was, they were definitely getting him ready for the invasion. I definitely think they were getting, uh, you know, Angle ready for the baby face turn. You know, the King of the Ring coronation the next night was was perfect because the, the whole point was to keep Angle away from the coronation. So to do that, they, they kind of baited him into staying with Austin and Vince, and they had all these vegetables there just to keep him away from it. So I thought that, that worked beautifully, and it definitely kind of transitioned Angle to being a babyface. But w with Shane, though, the, the performance is so over the top that, you know, how could this turn somebody heel? Like, it's just it just doesn't make sense for the top heel that's going to lead the invasion to be put on that kind of a performance. It just doesn't make sense. And, and the fact that Shane is actually WCW and, you know, he's trying to lead the WCW at the time. It's just, I just think a lot of fans are really confused uh, about who to cheer for there. And that, that leads into the main event too, where this whole night there's rumors that if Chris Benoit, or Chris Jericho win the tag team or win the titles or win the title, excuse me, that they're going to jump to WCW. So I don't see how that's good either. I don't see, you know, you, you're supposed, you know, Austin's supposed to be the top heel, and yet, if either guy beats him, they're going to jump to WCW. So this is still a very pro WWE audience. They kind of see WCW as a negative. So I think the the crowd was a little bit confused about, you know, who to really cheer for here. And you had that whole thing where, you know, Angle was going to, you know, ma make uh, the wrestlers starve to death if any WCW wrestlers uh, interfered. Ultimately, it ended up being Booker T interfering in the main event. Uh, all right, so next up we have Stone Cold Steve Austin defending the belt against Chris Benoit and Chris Jericho. Uh, triple threat match for the WWE Championship. All right, so Triple H tore his quad. You know, Benoit and Jericho win the tag team titles. Eventually, Austin screwed Benoit and Jericho out of the belts. So Linda McMahon actually made this a triple threat match within the interest of fairness. And uh, so ultimately, Austin said to Vince, you know... Uh, you know, you need to you need to choose between Linda McMahon and, and Stone Cold Steve Austin. And then, and then Vince said, well, I'm going to give you an ultimatum. If you don't leave King of the Ring as the WWF champion, then me and you, we're done. We're through. So, so the storyline here ended up being more about Austin and Vince and Austin being paranoid that Vince wasn't going to help him instead of, you know, there was really a lot of good stuff here between Benoit and Jericho. I mean, you go back to Edmonton or if you go back to the, the Raw in San Jose with... Jericho calling Austin a slut. There was some really good stuff that they could have used in this video package. But when you get to this match right here, the, the, whenever like a storyline just focuses on one guy, it's pretty obvious that the champion or the one guy is going to pretty much go over. So that's the one thing I don't like about it. And Jericho even said in his book that he, he thought the buildup sucked and he thought the match was just as bad because the crowd just didn't care. So that leads you to the, the whole situation with the crowd here. I'll tell you what. The crowd, the crowd wasn't great throughout this whole show, but I still like the match, though. So I disagree with that. I, I still, you know, there's going to be people that are going to think I'm overrating the match, but I think the match is awesome. I, I really think it is. I, I, I love this combination. I love the Benoit and Jericho push. I think the Benoit and Jericho push w was awesome. It, it, I think we can all agree. It really provided, you know, some of the best matches and and weeks of WWE television going into, you know, the end of school and in, in, in end of the school year in 2001, June 2001. Uh, you just had, you know, 
someone even pointed out in the Judgment Day review that, you know, no wonder Benoit had to get neck surgery. You look at all the classic matches he had from Judgment Day until the end of May. It was just, it was just incredible. But, uh, but yeah, you know, with, with Stone Cold taking on uh, uh, Benoit and Jericho here, it would have been inter interesting to see how they would have booked this had Triple H not gotten hurt. Would it have been a fatal four-way? I, I, I really think it might have been a tag team title rematch. But, uh, you know, we'll never know. And, you know, at this point, who really cares? Let's just focus on the uh, the triple threat match right here. I I'll tell you what. Yeah, the, the crowd really wasn't into it. Um, I, yeah, I, I do think a lot of it had to do with they were a little bit hesitant to root for Benoit and Jericho because of the WCW rumors. Um, but, yeah, you know, you just had to sit through the King of the Ring match with uh, Shane and Kurt. So I think I think after seeing such a monumental performance like that, it was it was it was definitely tough to follow. But uh, yeah, I I still thought this was great stuff. I, I feel like if if Benoit and Jericho went one on one here, this probably w would have been the best Benoit and Jericho singles match. I just thought both guys looked even better than they did in two thousand, especially Jericho. You could definitely tell Jericho put on more muscle, just looked better in the ring. He 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 looked more like a main eventer than a you know more of a light heavyweight that he looked like in two thousand. And it, it you just had good um you know they they really weren't trying to you know go for cheap. Uh, near falls here and that's what I kind of like about it. It it, it just kind of ended up being more of a one-on-one -on -one match with one guy laying out on side of the ring. It it, it worked really well uh, in, in my opinion for the most part. Um, you know, really the only times fa the fans reacted is when Austin would give them the finger. So I, I can't really tell you that the crowd was, you know, the crowd was nowhere near as hot for Benoit as it were in Canada uh, and, and things like that. But um but yeah, you know, you, you you just you just had some creative stuff. I, I like the part when Benoit and Jericho, you know, put him in the crossface in the walls of Jericho. Austin's tapping, but you know, because it's a simultaneous submission, it it doesn't count as a uh, submission. I thought that was cool stuff. Uh, ultimately, Booker T actually comes out of nowhere and throws Austin on the announce table, and Austin actually breaks three bones in his back. So when, uh, yeah, you know, when Booker T threw Austin, like he kind of threw him at the edge of the Spanish announce table. And so I, I think if, if Booker c had kind of planted him a little bit better, uh, you know, maybe Austin wouldn't have got his hurt. A apparently that's what kind of, you know, started, uh, you know, got Booker T off to kind of a, a tough start in the uh, WWE at first. Like there was a lot of, I guess he took a lot of shit for that. I didn't know it at the time, but apparently that's that's what happened. But uh, but yeah, man, I mean, good stuff here. You know, um, you know, uh, Jer Jericho did some beautiful counters uh, into the walls of Jericho. Um, you know, Benoit, once again, the vicious German suplexes, uh, the setup to the flying headbutt, you know, came off great. Uh, yeah, I mean, just, I just thought this th this was just sharp. Uh, there was one part in the match where Austin actually tries to put Jericho on the walls of Jericho. And, and as as uh, Jericho counters it, Austin lands on his head. And then he just he looks so pissed like he, he just he jammed his hand into the mat like he's like he knew he fucked up. Or I don't know if he's mad at Jericho. I mean, it's really nobody's fault. It's just it's just a tough move to counter with that falling on your head. So uh, so yeah, man. I I I thought I thought the finish here was at the time it was head scratching though. So uh, Austin's trying to get back into the ring. Jericho's hitting him with that wooden board that's attached to the announce table. So Jericho actually uh, does a moon salt, not a line salt, moon salt to Austin to put him away. Can't do it. Benoit makes the save. Benoit actually does a backdrop suplex uh, to Jericho off the top rope. So when Benoit comes down, he sells the shit out of it like he broke his neck, and and that's the thing what what broke his neck. Now I don't I don't know it's one hundred percent for sure, but I just think Benoit was selling uh, that as his last bump before neck surgery. I'm I'm pretty sure. Uh, Benoit has been pretty candid that, you know, you know, he, he needed to get neck surgery a little bit sooner than this, but he was just putting it off until the uh, king of the ring. So it was a culmination of just different injuries. But it is funny how, you know, both times Angle and Benoit uh, feuded, you know, both of them needed neck surgery. In 2001, it was Benoit. In 2003, it ended up being Angle. So that that's the unfortunate part about this. But I, I do think people kind of shit on this match because of the finish. But I think when you look back at the finish and you look back at how much uh, the neck surgery really impacted Benoit's career, it really is, it's a good finish. It's a realistic finish. You know, Austin 
covers Benoit as he's selling the neck injury and Austin successfully retains the title. JR calls him the luckiest man in the state of New Jersey because of the whole lottery ticket thing. So, uh, so yeah, man, I, I, I still think it's a good triple threat match. I, I think it was really engaging. I thought it was crisp. I, you know, these are three of my favorite wrestlers of all time. So I still think the combination worked. Uh, and, you know, I, I would have loved to have seen this in front of a hotter crowd, you know, maybe a crowd that wasn't as fried. Um, but still, still, still really good stuff right there. So, uh, you know, Austin uh, retains the title with a broken back. Uh, Benoit would go to get neck surgery and ultimately Jericho uh, sided with the WWF and uh, stayed and didn't jump to WCW. So that's King of the Ring 2001, and I'm out. All right.